Sometimes you need to remind yourself what you've already done. Because it's a long time since 2020, in lockdown, when my then 10-year-old daughter and I set out to build our own EV. Here's a quick recap. Stuck at home together, some of my car nerdery rubbed off on my kids. They started watching YouTube over my shoulder and getting excited about particular cars. What most got their attention was classic roadsters from the 50s and 60s. At the same time, I had stumbled across the open inverter community and was starting to think about building an EV. The two things came together and we decided to build an electric retro roadster. It needed to be affordable, have some modern safety features, so I looked at body conversions based on 90s cars, eventually selecting the BMW Z3 and the Tribute Automotive Z300S kit. But before we could get into any of that, we needed to prove that we could make a motor spin. The first thing I bought was a Mitsubishi Outlander front motor or generator from Second Life EV Batteries. It was relatively cheap, though with experience I know I could have spent less. And there was some optimism on the forum about its potential. I paired this with a Prius Gen 3 inverter and a control board from Damien at EV BMW. We scrounged a load of half-dead lead-acid batteries from the local auto electrician to make up a pack for testing and set to work. This phase took a long time. My skills in code, electronics and electrical engineering were rusty at best. My engineering degree was 20 years ago and I'd never used it in anger. And frankly, I hadn't been the most diligent student. So I got tired of waiting and bought a car. An MOT Failure Z3 came up on Gumtree and I grabbed it for 800 quid. I was rather focused on the emissions being the reason for its failure and overlooked the fact that the car had lived on the south coast and it may have been rather exposed to the elements. Sure enough, when it arrived we found huge amounts of rust. I ended up rebuilding both rear spring mounts and welding up the front and rear of both inner sills. The outers were completely rotten. But we made it solid eventually and cured all its other faults. From a failed electric hood to a penny wedged in the seat runner. We even got it running right before hauling the engine out. By this point we'd got the electric motor spinning, a huge moment, and so it was time to start putting the electric motor into the car, and time for the next big outlay. Batteries. We went for a BMW hybrid pack off eBay that I picked up from someone's backyard in Bradford, about 8 kilowatt hours for another 800 quid. Again, I'd now pay less. The old motor came out and was sold, and all the ancillaries came off too, being variously sold, scrapped, or kept for future use. We also replaced the shot suspension all round, with new parts and a cheap coilover kit, giving us some basic adjustability, at least at the front end. I had no idea where to buy steel locally, and ended up at an architectural steel supplier. This meant our first attempt at an adapter plate was made out of 3mm 40x40 box section and 8mm plate. This was all welded up in my backyard with a welder I rescued from a skip outside a local garage. As was the battery box made from the carcass and old washing machine and all the various frames and legs to mount it all. My 10 slash 11 year old daughter by this point did a fair chunk of the welding, particularly on the battery box. For charging, we picked up a Mitsubishi Outlander charger, as they're nice and simple, and we added various other ancillaries. The standard Vauxhall Zafira power steering pump, Heller vacuum pump for the brake booster, and all the required pipes and wires. A bike radiator did the cooling, with a couple of servo fans strapped to it, and a little oil radiator was meant to cool the motor, though I never got that cooling loop working properly. Eventually we got the car to the point where we could drive it, and promptly set off for the MOT station. Obviously, it failed. The first failure mostly had nothing to do with the EV stuff. They judged all our welding to be sound, but I had the tracking massively out, there was an oil leak coming from somewhere, in the end it turned out more than one, and drive was cutting out periodically. What followed was a long period of troubleshooting. That included me buying a lathe in order to make a new coupler that was actually straight. I'd eyeballed the first one, bodged together from two clutch centres. Eventually, on our fourth attempt, and after 15 months in total, we got the car through its MOT and started driving. And it was glorious. Okay, it felt great because we'd built the car, but the car itself? It needed work. 
It was butt ugly, dinged and rusty. It was slow and the handling was meh. Nonetheless, it got featured in one of my favourite car magazines, the sadly missed Practical Performance Car. So the next project was to make it the car we always wanted it to be, with classic sports car looks and sports car performance. I found a garage space about 15 minutes drive from my house where I could work on it and did a deal for what I thought was going to be three years. That's called foreshadowing. I ordered the body from Tribute Automotive and I sourced a larger motor, the rear motor from the Outlander. While fitting this I completely rebuilt the adapter plate, mounting frames and battery box, shifting everything down and towards the centre of the car, reducing weight and making it all easier to work on. With some tuning, performance was greatly improved. For a couple of weeks. I screwed up one of the measurements for the adapter plate, putting axial load on the motor. They don't like that. And it blew a bearing while I was on my way to the shops. So the car came off the road again, this time for longer, as I decided now was the time to fit the new body. This meant stripping all the BMW panels off and doing some more remedial work on the rusty parts. The sills were showing creeping rust again, so I had to be taken back to bare metal as much as possible. I'd just got all the body panels fitted when I got some bad news from my landlord. Although we'd talked about three years, we'd settled on a one year rolling contract. And he had now decided that he wanted to use the garage for himself. This meant I had just a couple of months to clear out. I had invested huge amounts of time and money getting the garage up to spec and replicating my tools at home so that I didn't need to keep moving things from one place to another. And naturally, with more space, I'd acquired more stuff. This included a second project car. I'd always liked the idea of having two cars, one for summer and one for winter, so that one can always be off the road for upgrades while you're driving the other. The Tribute Automotive GT body really appealed, so when another Z3 MOT failure came up even cheaper, I jumped at it, having clearly not learned my lesson. This one, despite not living on the coast, proved to be even rustier than the first. So under time pressure to move out of the garage, I decided to strip it of all the useful parts, sell what I didn't need and scrap the rest. I've pretty much broken even and I still have a whole interior and a load of other parts that will be really valuable for my other projects. I got the project car as close to running as I could, but in the end I ran out of time and had to move it on the back of a trailer into a storage unit, along with all my tools, shelves and parts going into another one. I'd also acquired a trailer by this point fortunately, but that's a whole other project. That's where things sat until May 2023, when I finally brought my running project car home, back to the drive where the whole project started. I did enough in the unit to get it moving again, then it got it back on the same trailer that took it to the storage unit, and now it's back here, where it will stay to be finished until I can afford to buy my own garage space a long-term ambition. The next steps are to get it MOT worthy and then get it painted or wrapped. In the meantime, I've bought another project car. Yes, it's another Z3, but I've learned my lesson. This time it doesn't have a square millimetre of rust. It's a Japanese import that has been garaged most of its life. Now that it has to live outside, I've had it professionally treated throughout to ensure it maintains its condition. This one will be powered by the electric CVT gearbox from a Lexus IS300H. It should be very powerful and will also have longer range and fast charging. I'm building up a test bid for it in my cellar workshop. So that's where I am today. Two project cars, limited workspace. Unlike most people, limited time and limited budget. Nonetheless, I'm trying to get out two videos each week to keep you updated and to keep me motivated, frankly, to keep me pushing on with all the different bits of the project. On this channel, I don't just talk about my projects either. I interview other people building their own EVs and some of the people and companies involved in supporting this incredible global community of DIYers. So if you like this stuff, whether it's my projects or other people's, please do subscribe, give us a like and follow along. Check out the podcast too. You can check out audio episodes of my interviews with other DIY EVers uh, on all of your favourite podcast channels. 
And go and have a look at me on Instagram as well. Check out at EV underscore DIY over there. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.